Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. I'm Bill Mallory, branch manager of the La Jolla Library. So glad that you could uh, join me this afternoon for another chapter of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Uh, this time we are reading uh, chapter 15. It's a, it's a little bit shorter chapter, uh, but the chapter that comes afterwards, after this, is actually much longer, so... I think we'll just do a short one uh, today, and then uh, on Wednesday at 4 when we do the next chapter, it'll be kind of a, a regular, decent-sized chapter. So so since we're doing a, a short chapter, uh, I just wanted to talk just real briefly about uh, some interesting things about War of the Worlds, since we have a little bit of, of extra time here. Um, one of them is uh, I, I'd like to find out what you folks are, are feeling like about the, uh, the book, uh, so far anyway. Um, it's, it's, it's a little different than I remember, I know that, and uh, I hope that, uh, you know, if you are at the uh, Facebook page for the group, for the Adventure and Mystery Book Club uh, group, then you can, uh, you know, add in your own comments. I'd love to uh, see what you are, what your feelings on the matter is, what your, what, what is your opinion of the story uh, up to this point, and, uh, and so hopefully, you know, we can kind of get a little dialogue going about some of the stuff that uh, that we've read so far. Um, other than that, there's it's it's kind of interesting because um, I know that there was I, I've said before that this this it feels to me a much more British story than I recall, mostly because H.G. Uh, Wells keeps naming all these places uh, where it all took place. You know the little the little tiny villages. Uh, as the Martians are moving through the the, the town, and uh, and all these are actual places, of course, and uh, and I'm sure that it was done at the time to kind of give a, a sense of authenticity to the whole story, because you remember that this is uh, supposed to be a almost like an autobiography. It's supposed to be like this is my story. I am now telling you this fantastic thing as it happened to me. And of course, you know it's all fiction, but that was the the style of the time. Uh, of course, I'm sure he was he was writing. He was a British author, so he was writing for a British audience. Uh, at the time this was happening, uh, the each chapter was was being serialized in in magazines. In this case, Pearson's magazine in England was serializing. Uh, chapters of War of the Worlds over a, a you know periodical uh, a publishing schedule, and uh, and so he was he was kind of playing to his audience. I think really he I think he was just uh, kind of saying, hey, uh, this is what's happening. It's all happening in these locations of which you guys are all familiar. Now it's interesting to me because. There, when they this did get serialized in the United States, also there's an American magazine that published it uh, as is, uh, in addition to the the British one. But there was also several uh, kind of knockoffs of it. There were several uh, uh, magazines that published it without authorization, and uh, one of them was the uh, I'm looking at my notes here, the New York Evening Journal published it, uh, and only they retitled it, and they called it Fighters from Mars, or, parentheses, War of the Worlds. Um, and so that, that went on. And then there was another one, the Boston Post, uh, actually uh, did an unauthorized uh, serialization of the story as well at the same time. And uh, this was also called Fighters from Mars. They, had, they changed it. However... They, they changed all the references, all the English towns, to, to Boston towns. I mean, bo areas around Boston uh, that people would, would recognize. Now, the New York Evening Journal did the same thing. It, it, if you read their version of H.G. Wells' story, uh, it would talk about how this all happened in New York and the area around New York. So... There was a, a a little bit of uh, a little bit of plagiarism going on here as they were serializing the story, making adjustments to fit, in this case, an American audience, 
by situating the the battle uh, uh, between the Earth and the Martians in New York and then in Boston, uh, depending on on the audience that they were they were playing to. So it's interesting to me. The Boston Post called it Fighters from Mars, but then the uh, subtitle was or War of the Worlds and near Boston. And so, okay, yeah, there it is. They're, that's exactly apparently what they're doing is wanted to let people, yeah, it's War of the Worlds, but then it's all it's also Boston. So anyway, it's obviously those versions, I'm sure you can look them up somewhere, but those are not canon, I guess you could say. And so we're going to... Uh, we're going we're gonna to read the original today. We're going to read chapter 15 of the original uh, War of the Worlds that H.G. Wells intended. Uh, and again, just a, a brief overview, of course, the uh, cylinders have been fired off like rockets from Mars landing on Earth, impacting in a, in a giant sand pit. And... Um, Right now, that there has been one per day, and there have been ten total that have been that have landed or have been fired from Mars, and uh, several of them have landed on Earth, but not all of them yet. Um, our hero has gone to a town to try to get his wife out of the the fighting, as the the Martians are are working in the pit. Turns out that they are building the tripods that are the large mechanical. Uh, walking machines that are uh, give them mobility and Earth's much higher gravity, and of course are armed with the fearsome uh, heat ray that is sweeping destruction around the English villages and countryside. Um, and then, so so we have our our main character who is never named, by the way, and uh, he is uh, trying to. He, he he put his wife in a in a town uh, to keep her safe, and then he goes back to go get their stuff from their house, and then gets caught up at the time in the middle of this whole big. There's a, there's a fight, and then there's the the Martians in their tripods, and then there's the military coming in, and then it's the military versus the Martians, and he's just trying to stay alive, and he and a uh, a gentleman who was a curate, who was a you know if you don't know it's a religious uh person kind of like a uh assistant priest kind of and and so this curate and and he are um are kind of hiding now and then in the last chapter we found out that the author's brother uh was b basically telling you what was happening in other parts of england specifically around london and uh, and and so we got a kind of a different perspective so last chapter was kind of an aside by the way while we we're hiding this is what was going on in other parts of of england and and now here we are in chapter 15 however we return to our narrator our original narrator and uh, this chapter is entitled what happened in surrey it was while the curate had sat and talked so wildly to me under the hedge in that flat meadow near Halliford, and while my brother was watching the fugitives stream over Westminster Bridge, that the Martians had resumed the offensive, as far as one can ascertain from the conflicting accounts that have been put forth, the majority of them remained busied with preparations in the horsel pit until nine that night, hurrying on some operation that disengaged huge volumes of green smoke. But three Martians certainly came out about eight o'clock and advanced and advancing slowly and cautiously made their way through Byfleet and Pierford toward Ripley and Weybridge, and so came in sight of the expectant batteries against the setting sun. These Martians did not advance in a body, but in a line perhaps a mile and a half from his nearest fellow. They communicated with one another by means of siren-like howls, running up and down the scale from one note to another. It was this howling and firing of guns at Ripley and St. George's Hill that we heard at Upper Halliford. The Ripley gunners' unseasoned artillery vet volunteers, who ought 
never to have been placed in such a position, fired one wild, premature, ineffectual volley, and bolted on horse and foot through the deserted village, while the Martian, without using his heat ray, walked serenely over their guns, stepped gingerly among them, passed in front of them, and so came unexpectedly upon the guns of uh, Paynes Hill Park, which he destroyed. The St. George's Hill men, however, were better led or of a better metal. Hidden by a pine wood as they were, they seemed to have uh, quite uh, have been quite unsuspected by the Martian nearest to them. They laid their guns as deliberately as if they had been on parade and fired at about a thousand yards range. The shells flashed all around the giant. He was seen to advance a few paces, stagger, and go down. Everybody yelled together, and the guns were reloaded in frantic haste. The overthrown Martian set up a prolonged ululation. There we go. That was I knew this was going to give me a, a tough time. A prolonged ululation. And immediately a second glittering giant answered him, appeared over the trees to the south. It would seem that a leg of the tripod had been smashed by one of the shells. The whole of the second volley flew wide of the Martian on the, on the ground, and simultaneously both companions brought their heat rays to bear on the battery. The ammuni ammunition blew up, the pine trees all about the guns flashed into fire, and only one or two of the men who were already running over the crest of the hill escaped. After this, it would seem that the three took counsel together and halted, and the scouts who were watching them report that they remained absolutely stationary for the next half hour. The Martian who had been overthrown crawled tediously out of the hood, a small brown figure, oddly suggestive from that distance of a speck of blight, and apparently engaged in the repair of his support. At nine he had finished, for his cowl was then seen above the trees again. It was a few minutes past nine that the night that the night when these uh, that night when these three sentinels were joined by four other Martians, each carrying a thick black tube. A similar tube was handed to each of the three, and the seven proceeded to distribute themselves at equal distances along a curved line between St. George's Hill, Weybridge, and the village of Send, southwest of Ripley. A dozen rockets sprang out of the hills before them as soon as the notes the, the Martians began to move and warned the waiting batteries near Dutton and Escher. At the same time, four of the fighting machines, similarly armed with tubes, crossed the river. Two of them, black against the western sky, came into sight of the curate and myself as we hurried wearily and painfully along the road that runs northward out of Halliford. They moved, it seemed to us, on a cloud, for a milky mist covered the field and rose to a third of their height. At this sight the curate cried faintly in his throat and began running but I knew it was no good running from a Martian. I turned aside and crawled through dewy nettles and brambles into the broad ditch by the side of the road. He looked back, saw what I was doing, and turned to join me. The two giants halted, the nearer to us standing and facing Sunbury. The remoter, being a gray indistinctness toward the evening star, away toward Staines. The occasional howling of the Martians had ceased. They took up their positions in the huge crescent about their cylinders in absolute silence. It was a crescent with twelve miles between its horns. Never since the devising of gunpowder was the beginning of a battle so still. To us, and to an observer about Ripley, it would have had precisely the same effect, 
The Martians seemed in solitary possession of the darkling night, lit only as it was by the slender moon, the stars, the afterglow of the daylight, and the ruddy glare from St. George's Hill and the woods of Painsel. But facing that crescent everywhere at Staines, Hounslow, Ditton, Escher, Ockham, behind hills and woods south of the river, and across the flat grass meadows to the north of it, however, was a cluster of trees, or village houses gave sufficient cover. The guns were waiting. The signal rockets burst and rained their sparks through the night and vanished. And the spirit of all those watching batteries rose to a tense expectation. The Martians had uh, but to advance into the line of fire, and instantly those motionless black forms of men, those guns glittering so darkly in the early night, would explode into thunderous, into the, a thunderous fury of battle. No doubt the thought that was uppermost in a thousand of those vigilant minds, even as it was uppermost in mine, was the riddle. How much they understood of us. Did they grasp that we in our millions were organized, disciplined, working together? Or did they interpret our spurts of fire, the sudden stinging of our shells, our steady investment of their encampment, as we should the furious unanimity of onslaught in a disturbed hive of bees? Did they dream they might exterminate us? At the time, no one knew what food they needed. A hundred such questions struggled together in my mind as I watched that vast sentinel shape. And in the back of my mind was the sense of all the huge unknown and hidden forces, uh, Londonward. Had they prepared pitfalls? Were the powder mills at Hounslow ready as a snare? Would Londoners have the heart and courage to make a greater Moscow of their mighty province of houses? Then, after an interminable time, it seemed to us crouching, peering through the hedge, came a sound like the distant concussion of a gun, another nearer, and then another, and then the Martian beside us raised his tube on high and discharged it, gun-wise, with a heavy report that made the ground heave. The one toward Staines answered him. There was no flash, no smoke, simply that loaded detonation. I was so excited by these heavy, minute guns following on, uh, following on one another that I forgot my personal safety and my scalded hands and clambered up the, to the hedge to stare toward Sunbury. As I did so, a second report followed, and a big projectile hurtled overhead towards Hounslow. I expected at least to see smoke or fire or some such evidence of its work, but all I saw was the deep blue sky above, and one solitary star, and the white mist spreading wide and low beneath. There had been no crash, no answering explosion, the silence was restored. The minute lengthened to three. What has happened? asked the curate, standing up beside me. Heaven knows, said I. A bat flickered by and vanished. A distant tumult of shouting began and ceased. I looked again at the Martians and saw he was now moving eastward toward the riverbank with a swift rolling motion. Every moment I expected the fire of some hidden battery to spring upon him, but the evening calm was unbroken. The figure of the Martian grew smaller as he receded, and presently the mist and the gathering night had swallowed him up. By a common impulse we clambered together. Toward Sunbury was a dark appearance, as though a conical hill had suddenly come into being there, hiding our view of the farther country. And then, remoter, 
across the river over Walton, we saw another such summit. These hill-like forms grew lower and broader even as we stared. Moved by a sudden thought, I looked northward, and there I saw a third of these cloudy black copies had risen. Everything had suddenly become very still, far away to the southeast, marking the quiet. We heard the Martians hooting to one another, and then the air quivered again with the distant thud of their guns. But the earthly artillery made no reply. Now, at the time we, we could not understand these things, but later I was to learn the meaning of these ominous copies that gathered in the twilight. Each of the Martians standing in the great crescent I have described had discharged by means of the gun-like tube he carried a huge canister over whatever hill, copse, cluster of houses, or other possible cover for guns chanced to be in front of him. Some fired only one of these, some two. As in the case of the one we had seen, the one at Ripley, is said to have discharged no fewer than five at that time. These canisters smashed in striking the ground. They did not explode and immediately disengaged an enormous uh, volume of heavy inky vapor, coiling and pouring upward in a huge and ebony cumulus cloud, a gaseous hill that sank and spread itself slowly over the surrounding country. And the touch of that vapor, the inhaling of its pungent wisps, was death to all that breathes. It was heavy, this vapor, heavier than the densest smoke. After the first tumultuous uprush and outflow of its impact, it sank down through the air and poured over the ground in a manner rather liquid than gaseous, abandoning the hills and streaming into the valleys and ditches and water courses, even as I, uh, even as I have heard the carbonic acid gas that pours from volcanic clefts is wont to do. And where it came upon water, some chemical action occurred. The surface would be instantly covered with a powdery scum that sank slowly and made way for more. The scum was absolutely insoluble, and it, was, it is a strange thing, seeing the instant effect of the gas, that one could drink it without hurt, uh, the water from which it had been strained. The vapor did not diffuse as a true gas would do. It hung together in banks, flowing sluggishly down the slope of the land and driving reluctantly before the wind, and very slowly it combined with the mist and moisture of the air and sank to the earth in the form of dust. Save that an unknown element, giving a group of four lines, in the blue of the spectrum is concerned, we are still entirely ignorant of the nature of this substance. One, once the tumultuous upheaval of its dispersion was over, the, uh, was over, the black smoke clung so closely to the ground, even before its precipitation, that fifty feet up in the air, on the roofs and upper stories of high houses, and on great trees, there was a chance of escaping its poison altogether, as was proved even that night at Street Chobham and Ditton. The man who escaped at the former place tells a wonderful story of the strangeness of its coiling flow and how he looked down from the church spire and saw the houses of the village rising like ghosts out of its inky nothingness. For a day and a half he remained there, weary, starving, and sun-scorched. The earth under the blue sky and against the prospect of the distant hills, a velvet black expanse, with red roofs, green trees, and later black-veiled shrubs and gates, barns, outhouses, and walls rising here and there into the sunlight. But that was at Street Chobham. 
uh, uh, where the black vapor was allowed to remain until it sank of its own accord into the ground. As a rule, the Martians, when it had served its purpose, cleared the air of it again by wading into it and directing a jet of steam upon it. This they did with the vapor banks near us, as we saw, in the starlight from the window of a descended, of, I'm sorry, a deserted house at Upper Halliford, whither we had returned. From there we could see the searchlights on Richmond Hill and Kingston Hill going to and fro, and about eleven the windows rattled and we heard the sound of the huge siege guns that had been put in position there. These continued intermittently for the space of a quarter of an hour, sending chance shots at the invisible Martians at Hampton and Ditton. And then the pale beams of the electric light vanished and were replaced by a bright red glow. Then the fourth cylinder fell, a brilliant green meteor, as I learned afterwards, in Bushy Park. Before the guns on Richmond and Kingston line, uh, line of hills began, there was a fitful cannonade far away in the southwest due, I believe, to guns being fired haphazard before the black vapor could overwhelm the gunners. So, setting about it as methodically as men might smoke out a wasp's nest, the Martians spread this strange stifling vapor over the Londonward country. The horns of the crescent slowly moved apart until, at last, they formed a line from Hanwell to Coombe and Malden. All night through their destructive, uh, all night through, their destructive tubes advanced. Never once, after the Martian at St. George's Hill was brought down, did they give the artillery to the ghost of a chance against them. Wherever there was a possibility of guns being laid for them unseen, a fresh canister of the black vapor was discharged, and where the guns were openly displayed, the heat ray was brought to bear. By midnight, the blazing trees along the slopes of Richmond Park and the glare of Kingston Hill threw their light upon a network of black smoke blotting out the whole valley of the Thames, and extending as far as the eye could reach. And through this, two Martians slowly waded and turned their hissing steam jets this way and that. They were sparing of the heat ray that night, either because they had but a limited supply of material for its production, or because they did not wish to destroy the country, but only to crush and overawe the opposition they had aroused. In the latter aim, they certainly succeeded. Sunday night was the end of the organized opposition to, to their movements. After that, no body of men would stand against them, so hopeless was the enterprise. Even the crews of the torpedo boat boats and destroyers that had been that had brought their quick firers up the Thames refused to stop, mutinied, and went down again. The only offensive operation men ventured upon after that night was the preparation of mines and pitfalls, and even in that their energies were frantic and spasmodic. One has to imagine, as well as one may, the fate of those batteries towards Escher, waiting so tensely in the twilight, survivors there were none. One may picture the orderly expectation, the officers alert and watchful, the gunners ready, the ammunition piled to hand, the limber gunners with their horses and wagons, the groups of civilian spectators standing as near as they were permitted, the evening stillness, the ambulances and hospital tents with the burned and wounded from Weybridge. Then, the dull resonance of the shots the Martians fired, and the clumsy projectile whirling over the trees and houses and smashing amid the neighboring fields. One may picture, too, 
the sudden shifting of the attention, the swiftly spreading coils and bellyings of that blackness, advancing headlong, towering heavenward, turning the twilight into a palpable darkness, a strange and horrible antagonist of vapor, striding upon its victims, men and horses near it, seen dimly running, shrieking, falling, headlong, shouts of dismay, the guns suddenly abandoned, men choking and writhing on the ground, and the swift broadening out of the opaque cone of smoke. And then night and extinction, nothing but a silent mass of impenetrable vapor hiding its dead. Before dawn, the black vapor was pouring through the streets of Richmond, and the disintegrating organism of government was, with, the, with a last expiring effort, rousing the population of London to the necessity of flight. And we will end it there. That is the end of chapter 15. Uh, people are not looking good for our, our earthlings. Uh, we'll see what happens in the next chapter next Wednesday at uh, 4 p.m. I uh, hope you can join me. Thank you very much for being here for uh, this one, for Chapter 15. And uh, hope you have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you again. Bye, everyone.